Now, it's Pentecost Sunday today, and uh, some of you are terrified by that thought, and that's okay. But uh, I wanted to uh, have a look at what Pentecost was. If you've got the notes there on the app, you'll be able to follow. Um, if you've got a Bible, you've probably got some of these scriptures uh, down pat, I'm sure. Pentecost, why is it called Pentecost? Why is it? Uh, it's called Pentecost because Pente is the Greek word for 50, and it occurs 50 days after Easter in the Christian calendar. Now, for, our, <coughs> for us Pentecostals, and we are a Pentecostal church, we remember it as a time when the Holy Spirit was poured out onto mankind. There was rushing wind, there were tongues of fire above people's heads, and people were speaking with other languages. But what you may not realise is that Pentecost was happening long before Acts 2. And I want to go back and look at what Pentecost was about, right back to the tr where it started. What was it about? What was God doing? And what does it mean for us today? So we want to track it right through from the first Pentecost right the way through to today. So Pentecost is one of the seven feasts. Now, for, I have to acknowledge Peter here because he's been schooling me in, in uh, some of these Jewish things. Thank you, sir. It's one of the seven feasts. I sound like I know what I'm talking about. I don't. He knows and he tells me, which is great. Uh, one of the seven feasts of the Jewish, Jewish culture. And I stopped and I thought for a minute, why so many feasts? Why, why, why does, does the Jewish calendar have so many feasts? And some of you say, well, why are we even talking about the Jews? Aren't we in the New Testament? Yes, we are. We're, you know, now, it's Pentecost Sunday, part of the church. And uh, we're, not going, we're not becoming Jewish. We're not going back and becoming Jewish. But we can learn from them, can't we? We can understand. So why so many feasts? Um, there's several reasons. I think the top three reasons for having so many feasts is, number one, festivals required people assembling together. So they got everybody together because it was a, was a party. Our slogan of this church is real people, real community and real God. But long before we were talking about real community, God was on about real community back in the day. And he thought, if I can get these guys together around a table feasting, we'll have a community going. So right back then at the start, you know, back when, when Israel was, was, was being birthed, if you like, back in, in the Passover and all that sort of stuff, God was on about unity and he was on about community. The second thing is that festivals focused on the past act of, acts of God. So, you know, this is why we're sharing this stuff with you about these blessings. We've got one that's very current today. We've got one that's older where a gentleman gave 700000 to Lily House or people who've given to this church or people who've got jobs or people who've been healed. See, when we talk about what God's done, it builds us all up for the future. And as, as we see God do little things, it, it, it layers in and we start to believe God for more and more. And that's why I'm saying, like, if you want to see miracles, hang out where miracles are happening, because everybody's used to it. And uh, my friend Eric had an album, he called it Expect a Miracle. And I'm kind of there, because when someone comes with a need, I'm just going, well, let's ask God, because he's just doing this stuff a lot. And you can trust him, because you can see it in the past. So the, 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 it ties the faith of one generation to the next. You know, Christianity is a generation, at any time, is a generation from extinction. We have to tell our children and their children and their children about the great acts of God. We have to share these great stories that God is doing. These will live forever if we keep speaking about them to the future generations. The third thing is that festivals bridge the gap between religious obligation and joyful celebration. Now, holy days were commanded, but they were intended to be joyous. But typical of mankind, we suck all the joy out of it and we put religion in. And so you've got people going through rituals and, and not understanding what they're doing and there's no joy. Have you been at a, you know, a tall people, you know, sorry, tall, steeple, few people sort of church, a very traditional church, and you walk in there and everyone looks like they've been baptised in lemon juice. You know, they, they, they're not happy. There's no joy. There's no laughter. Everybody's just like, well, this is church. When I was young, um, I grew up in, in the Baptist church and I remember being at a Baptist church and, and I was in church and I was actually enjoying it and someone had said something beside me. I was a young guy at the time and, and, and I, I laughed, I giggled, I thought it was, it was wonderful and a guy turned around to me he said, this is church, we don't laugh. <laughs> and I went, wow. You know, so... Festivals gave us a chance to, to, to take it from being religion and actually make it fun. How many of you know when you eat meals together, it's fun? 
You know, it really is. And, 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 and the messier the meal, the funner it is. That's the, that's the rule, I'm pretty sure. So that's what... See, Pentecost, it, it's one of the feasts, but it's about joy. It's not about fear and religion. It's about joy, unity, and it's about life. So why Pentecost? If you've got uh, your Bible, Leviticus 23... It outlines many of the Jewish feasts. And like most Jewish celebrations, most of these feasts, if not all of these feasts, point to Jesus. Now, we saw this with the Passover. We didn't do a Passover for Passover. We did it because every aspect of that points to Jesus. And it's the same with all of these, you know, and this particular feast as well points to Jesus Christ. So the Passover really points to the death of Jesus, his sacrificial death for us, when he laid his life down to save us from our sin. That's what the Passover really points to. But then uh, at the end of the Passover is, is, is a feast that they had called the Feast of the First Fruits. Now, First Fruits, um, that really indicates the resurrection of Christ. So you've got one that, that, that's pointing to the, the death of Christ and then one that's pointing to the resurrection of Christ. Then after that, that Sabbath... They counted seven Sabbaths, and the day after the seventh Sabbath, which was a Sunday, because Sabbath was a Friday, is 50 days, Pentecost. And it's 50 days after the first fruits. So, hence the Greek word uh, is Pentecost, which means 50. The, the Hebrew word is Shavia, which, which means Feast of Weeks and Feast of the Harvest. So, essentially, what we've got... We had Passover, where God delivered his people and where Jesus laid his life down, so it's, that's significant. Then you've got first fruits, where they celebrate the first fruits coming in of the harvest, because it's an agricultural economy. But it also celebrates Christ, the first fruits from the dead. And then 50 days later, we have Pentecost, where they're celebrating the harvest itself, and we are celebrating the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. You see how it all kind of lines up? Now, at first fruits, the, the priest waved sheaths of wheat. So he was offering, so he got these, these sheaths of wheat still on their stalks and they were waved before the Lord and that was the offering at first fruits. But at Pentecost, the priest actually offered two loaves of baked bread with leaven and because it's the harvest. So the grain that was there at first fruits was ground down and made into, into, uh, uh, you know, into bread, okay? So it's a, real, it's a union of particles, separate particles, into one homogenous body. And then leaven was added. Now, this is really interesting because leaven, as you know, if you, if you know anything about this, leaven usually represents sin, doesn't it? You know, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees. So... Leaven or, or, or yeast represents sin. So why would there be two loaves with yeast in them, with leaven in them? Well, if you think about it, there's significance to this as well. If you add leaven to it, it really represents mankind because we have sin in us, doesn't it? So what we've got here is, in this particular uh, feast, two loaves were offered, not one. Why two loaves? The Jew... And the Gentile. So, so this is where there's something about this Pentecost right back where Jew and Gentile were, were offered together. And so there was unity there. And uh, if you look at 2 Chronicles 30 verse 25, it says this, The whole assembly of Judah and the priests of the Levites and the whole assembly came out of Israel and the sojourners who came out of the land of Israel and the sojourners who lived in Judah. You see, back then... All these sojourners were there. And then it says the word rejoice. They all rejoice together. So what you've got is a situation. You've got the nation of Israel, but there are Gentiles mixed up in there. It's not, it's not exclusive. Even way back, it's not exclusive. God is bringing all people together. God's intention from the start was that men would be, would be worshipping him. All men would be worshipping, worshipping him. Hence the two loaves. Hence Galatians uh, 3.28. Paul writes... There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We love to separate things as people, don't we? We love to just, you know, we put them in neat little boxes. But he's saying, that doesn't matter to me. You're mankind and my son died for you. So from the start, from way back, Pentecost was not just for the Jews. It was for everyone but kind of well hidden at times. And Pentecost also was a time of generosity. We've just heard about the generosity of God to, to us here in Lily House. We didn't deserve that. 
We don't even really know how it happened, except that when they turned and asked this young lady who was there, who was serving as a, as a nurse there, she happened to be a graduate from Lily House and said, I know a good charity. I mean, this is amazing stuff, you see. Pentecost is a time of generosity. It was a time of giving. God gave the harvest to the people and the people gave it back to the Lord and they gave it to one another. It was not a time of grasping and getting and receiving. It was a time of giving. Leviticus 23 is very interesting. In the middle of all of the talk of the feast and what have you, it says this, verse 22. And when you reap the harvest of your land, so we're talking about a harvest festival here. When you reap the harvest of your land, when you're blessed, do not reap your field right up to the edge. Nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. So what, and what does that remind you of? What Bible story? Ruth and Boaz, doesn't it? Where Boaz was doing that, he was leaving the gleanings there for the poor people to come and get. See, it was a time of giving. It wasn't a time of grasping at all. My dad was a great business guy and he always said, if you want to make a really good business deal, leave a little bit in for the next guy. But the world will tell you, squeeze everything as much as you can, but that's not God's way. He loves a generous spirit. So the people were commanded to be generous to the poor and outcasts. And God also was exceedingly and abundantly generous, as we're seeing he, even here today in our church. I mean, you, you know, look at all the miracles. Here are the testimonies. And I stand here today, I'm not, you know, I'll be honest with you, I have struggled in the area of faith for finances in the past. But man, I'm pumping right now. <laughs> I really am because I, God's just doing it, you know. But here's my testimony. And I stand as a testimony to this of the Lord's blessing and faithfulness. Luke 6.38. This is, this is something I took to heart. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. With the, for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So taking that at face value. If you use a teaspoon to bless other people, then you'll get a teaspoon of blessing back. But if you use a dump truck, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I think that's great. Now, some of you are thinking, oh my gosh, Pastor Darren has not only gone Jewish, he's also gone hyper-faith prosperity doctrine. Okay? No, I haven't. Because I don't believe in give to get. I don't. I believe, I believe in give to trust. Because what my experience is, if you have a generous spirit, God sorts it out. I'm not saying, hey, if you want a new car, give me all your money. Dial my 1-800 number and give to me. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is if you have a generous spirit, if you are a generous person, I don't know how it works, but it just seems to work and God provides for you every step of the way. Am I right? You see, so it's not gift to get, it's gift to trust. But at this particular time, God gives to us and we have to remember that if God blesses us, we must bless others. If we hold it all to ourselves, you know, Proverbs talks about there's a man that holds it to himself and comes to poverty. And there's the one that gives freely, yet becomes very wealthy. So, so there's something about this principle that works. If you have a generous spirit, God is generous with you. And I can attest to that. So let's go back to the first Pentecost. So you remember, a bit of, bit of history lesson here. You remember they had the Passover, and you remember all the miracles, the protection during the plagues, uh, the miracle of the Red Sea, the destruction of Pharaoh's armies, the salvation of the nation. So there were all these people back then. <coughs> they had the Passover. Then there was the first fruits. And then 50 days later, and people have often, I, I, I've had some um, interesting discussions. Some people get hung up on the weirdest things. And I've had people say to me, why does the church meet on Sunday? Why does the church, you know, why don't you meet on the Sabbath? Because that's the Sabbath. This is why we meet on the Sunday. Because it's, it's four times, uh, sorry, seven, seven times seven, which is 49 plus one. And that takes us from the Saturday to the Sunday. And the Sunday, as you'll see, is the birth of the church. That's why we celebrate it on a Sunday. But isn't it interesting? So if you have that discussion with some of our Saturday folks, um, you know, I... I Saturday night's all right for fighting, but, you know, we meet on a Sunday. In Exodus 19, so, so the people have had the Passover, there was first fruits in there, and then 50 days later, they have their first 
Pentecost or the first harvest, if you like. Now, there was nothing to harvest. But those 50 days later, where were they? Where were they? They were standing at the foot of Mount Sinai, ready to receive the law of God. So the first Passover is in Exodus 19. It's not called a Passover, but it is. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, said the Lord, and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That was what God said to them as they stood at the foot of the mountain, ready to receive the Ten Commandments. Holiness. God said, you will be holy. Now, it's an often overlooked part of God's character. I, you know, we, God is love. Do I hear an amen to that? God is love, right? But God is also holiness. And there's this huge tendency in our society today to, to say, well, well, you know, God just loves everybody. And, you know, you can be in sin and have a sinful life. God just loves everybody, and he does love everybody, but it doesn't mean he doesn't expect holiness, You know, we need to get serious about holiness. Without holiness, the Bible says, no one will see the Lord. If we want to see the Lord in our midst, we have to be holy. We can't dabble in that stuff. We can't agree with that stuff. We can't promote that stuff. We need to be holy. Do I hear an amen? Because, you know, because... Without holiness, we will not see the Lord. So that's, they're getting ready. That, that was in Exodus 19. In chapter 20, they're getting ready to receive the Ten Commandments. So Moses heads up the hill. God writes the Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone. And Moses delivers them to the people. Now you need to understand, the Ten Commandments is not just a Hollywood movie. Okay? It's not just the, the basis of our, of our judicial system, which it is. The Ten Commandments is not just law. What the Ten Commandments were was a covenant. It, in fact, it was a marriage covenant. What it was, was God saying, if, if you do your bit, I'll do my bit, and we will be betrothed together. We will be married together. It's actually a marriage covenant. Isn't that incredible? If you came to the Passover, you would have learned all of that. That, 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 that it's really, it's a symbol of a marriage relationship with God. So, Given that it's a marriage covenant, not just laws that were delivered, Exodus 20, verse 18 to 21. I'm going to read this. This is very, very significant because I want you to notice what people are doing, what the people are doing and saying here. Listen to this. Now, when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled. And they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us and we'll listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for the Lord has come to test you, that the fear of him may be in you, that you may not sin. And the people drew, stood afar off, while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. That's what happened at that first Pentecost. When the people right there, at that, God offered himself, Here's my covenant. Let me have relationship with you. Let me be close to you. And the people said, whoa, settle down, God. That's a bit in your face. We're afraid. And so, you know, as a husband might offer himself to his bride, God offered himself to those people and they rejected him. They chose rules over relationship right at that point. Moses, you go and find out all this stuff. You come back and tell us we'll do it. But don't have us actually meet God. We don't, we don't want relationship. We want rules. But right back then, God was going for a relationship. It seemed the safer option at the time, the more tangible and logical op- option. But in doing so, I believe that, that the people of Israel missed an incredible opportunity to have relationship with God instead of a bunch of rituals and rules. So, they blew it at that first Pentecost, and history bears out the witness of the consequences. But let's track forward to the one that we're familiar with, Uh, in Acts chapter 2, the later Pentecost, and see the parallels. And there are parallels um, with the later Pentecost. And I'm going to go through some of these. These are quite fascinating to see. You'll see God has had a plan right from the garden all the way through. Like like coronavirus didn't surprise God. he, He knows all this stuff. He's got plans in play already. He knows it all. So Jesus had died at this point for the second Pentecost. Um or for the later one. He died, he'd been resurrected, he appeared to many and he had ascended. And he said to the people, listen to this, this is where it gets really, really important. He said in John 16, 
Jesus said, it is to your advantage that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. That's the Holy Spirit. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Then in John 16, it says, When the Spirit of truth comes, the Holy Spirit again, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. What does that mean? It means that Jesus said before he ascended, he said, I've got to go because if I don't go, you don't get the Holy Spirit. Now, why would, why would he say that? Because things were about to change. Things, things were not going to be the same. Something incredible was about to happen and it required Jesus himself, the resurrected Jesus Christ, to go back to heaven, to his father's right-hand side, but someone else was coming. And you've got to remember, when we, we sang about it earlier, praise the Father three in one, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, it's the Trinity, that the three are one, they're not separate. Because we have human minds, we like to separate them. Well, God did this and Jesus did this, the Holy Spirit did They're all one. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ. If you read the scriptures, you'll realize that Christ was the one who spoke and the world sprang into being. What was the Father doing? Having a nap? You know, they're all one. And we don't understand this, but we believe it, that they are one. So what happened was the disciples are huddled together in the upper room, fearful, confused, wondering, still keeping the tradition. They're up there having a feast because that's what Jewish people do. Keep the feasts, got to do those. And so they're kind of, they're there, but they, they don't really know what's happening. Then in Acts chapter 2, a passage we'll be familiar with, starting from verse 1. Have a look at it. When the day of Pentecost arrived, or, or some versions say fully come, so they believe that Leviticus 23 is going to be fulfilled on this day. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as of fire, ignited, okay, I added that word, don't worry, um, and appeared to them, and rested on each of them. Shouldn't add to the Bible, sorry. <laughs> And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. See, God was still being generous all of these years later with these people huddled in the upper... He, God was still being generous. He was giving them an incredible gift that they couldn't even fathom at the time. He was giving the Holy Spirit of God to mankind and the church was born on that day. See, at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit baptized or filled believers. It came, the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, the God who created the world, came into the hearts of men for the first time. Now, if you look back, if you look back on, on, on all of the Old Testament, you'll realize that back in, the, back in the day, the Spirit of God came on people for a time. So, that, so, you know, like you get a guy like, like Gideon and he'd, he'd get filled, or Daniel, he'd get filled with the Spirit for a short, and then the, the Spirit would go. Because the Spirit did not dwell in the hearts of men. He came on men and, and off men. That's why David prayed, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. But on this day, the church was born and the Holy Spirit came and God was running according to his calendar. And he wasn't patching up the old Jewish garment and saying, wear this. This was a brand new robe, folks. Uh, never before had the Spirit of God actually lived in the hearts of men and women. He'd been external to, God, uh, uh, to them. But now for the first time, we see the Spirit of God entering the hearts of men and women. And we need to note the time and the sequence. After the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, he showed himself alive for 40 days. Then just before he ascended into heaven... He said, Luke 24, Behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father to you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Ten days later, the word says, on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God came on them. Acts 1.8, you know, wait in Jerusalem and you receive power. So, so when the Holy Spirit came, incredible power came into this group of men and women. 
right? And, and the power was that God, the creator of the universe, the one that they had just been fellowshipping with as the Son, came into their hearts. So what does it all mean? Well, it's very interesting. At the first Pentecost, Moses ascended the mountain. Do you remember the story? Moses goes up the mountain and he comes down and his brother Aaron had led the people and they had made a golden calf idol. Remember that? And 3,000 people died that day, slain that day. But at Pentecost, that fir- the, the first Pentecost of the church in Acts, Peter preached to how many people were saved that day? 3,000. Can you see the parallels? 3,000 slain, 3,000 saved. So many people, Pentecostals and Evangelicals, we get hung up on certain aspects of Pentecost, but we miss the point. The point of Pentecost is relationship. That's what, that's what it's about. It's not about, about um, you know, gifts or about tradition. Or about, it's about relationship. It always has been right from the very first one. It's about God reaching out and saying, I want to spend time with you. I want to connect with you. I want to be with you. I want to be in you. That's what Pentecost is about. The point is relationship. Back in the Old Testament, the people said, no, we don't want that. Give us the rules. We don't want relationship. But I believe we have to make a different decision today, don't you? Because we have an incredible opportunity. They didn't, that the Spirit of God would dwell within us. Centuries before Ezekiel had prophesied this in Ezekiel 36, to the people of Israel, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. See the rules are the external example of what's happening internally which is that he puts his spirit within us and if we fellowship with him as we as he wants us to the rules are not, a, not an issue. You're not obeying rules because you want to obey rules or rituals. They just come naturally because you want to be obedient because you love him. Can you hear me this morning? This is about relationship. And this is what happened at Pentecost. And Joel, of course, had predicted in Joel 2, And it shall come to pass that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your son... <laughs> sons and daughters will prophesy your old men will dream dream your young men will see visions that was what was prophesied what happened in Acts chapter 2 so that first the birth of the church was when the Holy Spirit was poured out and now we have the opportunity of a relationship that we rejected so long ago mankind rejected but now we can do it when you ask Jesus into your heart you have the Spirit of God living within you so it's a whole new concept It's unheard of before. The God himself would live within us. A deposit, uh, the Bible calls, a slice of heaven, if you will. So that every day you can live close to him and fellowship with him. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 22 says this, And who who, who also has put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee? How do you know that you're going to heaven? How can you be assured that you have eternal life? Because he's given you the Spirit as a deposit. That's what the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, when he comes into our hearts, he is the deposit because we now have relationship with God. Isn't that amazing? I think that's incredible. You know, I, I don't know if you've bought or sold houses or cars or something, but if you call up, a guy, you know, through, through the trading post or something and, and you say, I'd like to buy your car and I'll pay you X amount of dollars, you negotiate a fee. The first thing he says was, can you give us a deposit? And if you don't give him a deposit, he sells it to the next guy, doesn't he? Because he's guaranteed the next guy will get it. The deposit shows that you're serious. And when God gave us the deposit of the Holy Spirit into our hearts, he showed us he is serious about relationship. He's serious about community. He's serious about connecting with us forever. That's what the Holy Spirit is all about. But here's the question for the early Christians. How would they know if God's Spirit was dwelling within? How would they know? Because you could come in and say, well, I've got the Holy Spirit too. How would they know? We needed proof. They needed proof. 
that God was doing something different. I mean, you're talking about people who are, who are living in centuries and centuries of tradition. How did they know that stuff had changed? How did they know that God was doing this amazing new thing of placing his spirit within them? They had to have something to hang on to, something tangible that made sense, some sort of evidence. Because otherwise, some other guy could come in and say, yeah, I'm doing that too. And they wouldn't know. So the evidence that occurred was the gift of tongues, which is the initial proof of God's spirit actually dwelling within. And they desperately needed that. Because how are you going to know? And so that was the initial evidence there. The Spirit was poured out on the Jews at Pentecost. And, so, and they knew this because they, they were speaking of tongues. And they thought, okay, if they're speaking in tongues, that's the evidence. We know they've got it now. But that's not the jump for these Jewish people. Because if you know anything about Jews, there's only two types of people in the world for Jews. Jews and others. They call Gentiles. And so they, this little group of Jewish believers... That, that, that knew they had this deposit in their heart. How did they know that God was going to give it to the Gentiles? Because they'd say, whoa, we can't believe that that's going to happen. Not those guys. Surely the Gentiles won't get it as well. Well, eight chapters later, God will show, yes, the Gentiles are in on this. There's a fellow called Cornelius. He's a centurion. He was seeking God. And Peter... Remember the story? Peter had to be coaxed to go and meet him. Peter had to have a vision where God said, I'm going to, I'm going to accept everybody here. Remember the vision? It was dropped down from, from heaven and, and all of this food was there. And, and, and in the vision, the Lord said, Peter, take and eat. I can't eat that stuff. That's not ritually clean. That's not Jewish enough. It's not kosher. And God said, no. And he did this. He had to repeat it again and again because none of the Jews could believe that the Gentiles would actually get anything from God because the Jews were the chosen one. They're the riffraff. So, eight chapters later, we read in Acts chapter 10. Listen to what it says. And the believers from among the circumcised, which is the Jews, who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. How did they know? For they were hearing them speak in tongues and extolling God. So this is, you've got to realise that they had nothing to go on here. They didn't have scriptures that spelled this out. And God was so gracious to them. He said, I'm going to show you that I'm accepting the Gentiles too. Don't we thank God for that? Because I'm not a Jew. I will never be a Jew. But I'm a Gentile and I love God just the same. And God has poured his spirit into my heart because it's now open to everyone. So let me ask you a question. Who's afraid of the Holy Ghost? For many years, I confess to you, I was afraid of the Holy, Holy Spirit, of being filled with the Holy Spirit. I knew that uh, the Spirit lived in I knew I was saved. I knew the Spirit lived in me. I was actually in ministry, ministering all over the world. And, but I was afraid because I didn't want any weird stuff going on. Can anybody hear me out there? Some of you like that. Like I thought, nah, some of this stuff is weird. And uh, I'm not sure that I'm up for that. Now, I recognise in my life that I didn't have victory in many areas of my life, but I was resigned to the fact I'm a sinner, therefore I can put up with this, and of, of having a substandard you know, Christian walk. I realised I didn't have that victory, but the truth was I was simply afraid that if I yielded totally to God, he might do something really weird like give me the gift of tongues. Oh my goodness. What am I going to do if he does that? How am I going to handle that? You know? So I, I don't like weirdness very much. And, and, and I, kind of, I, I kind of looked at it and I thought, oh man. So I was afraid. But then it occurred to me, it's like learning to drive. Um, now, if, if you think about learning to drive, driving is scary. Lots of people, you know, have accidents on the road. They die on the roads. People get booked. People spend way too much money on cars and fuels. Why would you bother doing that? Because if you don't drive, you lose an incredible experience, don't you? Can you imagine if you'd never drove? And, and uh, some of you here maybe are like that. But, but for me... It's a great experience to drive. It's convenient. I can go places. I can, you know, travel and all this sort of stuff. Fiona and I are heading off on holidays this week. We're going to Tasmania. We're going to drive. But, but the actual, you know, if you look at all the downsides, it's pretty scary, really. 
And that's what it's like with the Holy Spirit. Don't let fear stop you from, from blessing. Don't let fear do it. Romans 8 verse 15 says this, You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit, the spirit again, of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. See, if God is your father, don't be a slave to fear. Don't be afraid of the good things God wants to give you. If you can trust him for salvation, you can, if you can call him Abba Father, if you can trust him for, for provision in your life, you can trust him for whatever he dishes out, can't you? And this is what occurred to me. I thought, thought man, you know, I reached a point where I said, I said, God, whatever it is, I'll take it. If you want to give me something, even if it's weird, I'll, I'll, I'm up for it. Because I just, I wanted more of God. And, I, and, and we tend to say, God, I want more if you just don't get outside of this box here because I, I'm uncomfortable with that. And I get that. I understand that. And this morning, I, we're not going to force anything on anybody this morning. Okay? So some of you here are thinking, oh, my goodness, they're going to make everyone speak in tongues. No, we're not. What we're going to do, I'm going to ask you to yield to the Holy Spirit and let him sort it out. Because if God is God, then he will give you the gifts that he wants you to have. And if, if, if you don't get that, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. If you're comfortable with that, we just want you in fellowship here. But I believe that God is going to touch lives this morning. Because if we yield to him, how can he not? He's doing all these miracles. If we, if we say, Lord, here I am. Use me. Take me. I'm, I'm 100% yours. Let's just trust him for whatever comes along. Here's the fact. I can't live the victorious Christian life. You might say, well, you're a pastor. You get, no, I can't, and neither can you. But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you can live in victory every day. Why? Because you're obedient to the Spirit that's in your heart. And that's how you live in victory, not by doing it yourself, but by, by being filled with the Holy Spirit again and again and again. People say, do you believe in the second blessing? I say, yeah, I believe in the second, third, fourth. Keep going. You know, I, any blessing the Lord wants to give me, I'm up for it. Are you up for that? You know, I don't care what it is. Even if it's weird. Boy, I hope it's not weird. I don't like weird. But, but if it is, I'm, you know, I'm up for it. But here's the thing. God is living within. He's not going to. He's not out to embarrass you or hurt you or confuse you. He just loves you. And my experience with the Holy Spirit is that he's gentle and kind. I do speak in tongues. It is a wonderful gift that I use every day to communicate with the Lord. I don't force it on anybody else. But I was filled with the Spirit long before I spoke in tongues, I've got to tell you. You can be filled with the Spirit, but let him sort out the rest. You really can. And for me, it took a little bit of time because I'm generally a bit slower than some. See, Pentecost was good news for the Jews. It was a time of blessing. It was a time of harvest. But it is awesome news for the Christians because it's God's Spirit living within us. It's about relationship. You cannot, but you cannot have Pentecost without plenty cost because it's not like God bless me, bless me, bless me, Right? Because there, there is a yielding to him. You have to trust him. You have to yield your life to him. You have to confess your sin, ask him for forgiveness, lay aside your will and your agenda and simply say with the psalmist, listen to this, Psalm 86, <coughs> teach me your way, O Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I might fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. It's simply saying, Lord, have your way. Pentecost, as I said, is not about rituals, tongues. That's what it's about is relationship. It's about saying, Lord, I'm yours. Have your way. And he'll touch some in one way, some in another way. But if we open our hearts to him this morning, God's going to touch us. He's going to touch our hearts. He's going to bless us because our hearts are yielded to him. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to yield to God. That feast of first fruits gets the people, you know, um, when, the, when the people, the, sorry, the, the, the feast back then, when the people had the choice to reject him or accept him, that's our choice today. We can say, okay, well, you know, I'm a Christian, but hey, I don't want any more than that. Or we can say, no, Lord, have your way. And I believe we can trust him to, to 
to touch our lives and empower us. That's how you live the victorious Christian life. You yield to the Holy Spirit and let him live his life through you. So if you're worried that God might give you the gift of tongues or something else, I want to recommend to you today, forget about the stuff, just yield to him and let him sort it. And if he does it, that's brilliant. And if he doesn't, that's fine. Just keep worshipping him. Can, can, you, can you meet me there? Can we walk that way? I just want your heart to be open and let God be God. Now remember that the tongues, tongues, the gift of tongues might be considered the initial evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. But I tell you what the long-term evidence is. The fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. Because that's something that, that, that lasts for eternity. How many of you would like more of the fruit of the Spirit in your life? How many of you would like more of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control? I would too. And we, we obtain the fruit of the Spirit in our life by yielding our lives to this same Holy Spirit who lives within us. So I'm, I'm believing this morning that all of us should yield our life to the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? Because I just want to say, Lord, I'm yours. Take me, I'm yours. If you're online, say the same thing. Take me, I'm yours. Why can't we just yield to the Holy Spirit and let him be God and let him lead and guide us? If you're not a Christian or if you've wandered far from him, maybe, maybe you've been out of fellowship with God. This is your moment to step back into it. Because like the people back there at Mount Sinai, you can choose rules and relationship or you can say, let's have a relationship, Lord. And he's knocking at that door. He's saying, let me in. I'll come in and sup with you and you with me. He wants relationship. If you're a believer, as most of us are, this is the moment when we can say, respond to the Spirit of God and say, Lord, I just want more of you. Just fill me with your Holy Spirit. God won't push himself on you. God won't give you anything that you can't handle or, or, or don't want to have. Just yield and trust him. This was the key point for me. Just yield and trust him. We're not forcing anything here this morning. We're just saying, hey, you're going to choose relationship or rules. Because if you choose relationship, God will bless your life. Are you up for that? I believe this is a great moment for us just to yield. You wouldn't be here if you didn't desire to love God more. You wouldn't be here if you weren't seeking for, to, to live a holy life for God. You wouldn't be here sitting in church this morning or tuning in online if you didn't have a hunger for God. And I think if we open our hearts and say, Lord, I yield to you, then this can be a really special Sunday. Why is Pentecost important? Because it's about relationship. It's about generosity. And it is about the Spirit of God living within us. The most, I mean, the people of the Old Testament longed for what we experience every day. And you've got the opportunity to dive even deeper and say, Lord, I yield to you. What an exciting journey. I remember praying that, saying, Lord, I just yield it to you. Whatever it is, Lord, I give it to you. I'm going to ask you to do that now. Would you bow your heads? Just bow your head. Search your heart. The Bible says, search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any offensive way, any unholy way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. As you search your hearts this morning, my question to you is, rules or relationship? Your choice. Now choose life. And I believe that God is going to speak to our hearts this morning. Don't be afraid. Just be filled. As you search your hearts, I'm going to ask you where, wherever you're seated. You may have done this before. You may be on fire for Christ right now. I don't know. But if you're willing to yield, I want you to stand where you are. And I'm praying that every single person in this room is standing. If you're willing to yield your life to Christ, just stand where you are now. Come on.
praise God. God's speaking to people here this morning. God loves you. He wants to wrap you up in his, in his arms and care for you. But you need to yield to him. We're going to sing some songs through here. And I'm going to invite you to come forward. Yes, it will be a holy catastrophe. I realize that because it's the whole church. But I want God to see us standing at the front, yielding our life to him. I want God to see us saying, Lord, whatever the cost, we just yield our life to you. So why don't you start coming forward? Come on, come forward right to the front. There's going to be a mess here. We'll be down the aisles. But there's something special happens when you step forward.